Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Brad, and I'm the campus pastor here in Argyle, and I'm also on the preaching team. If you would grab your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Romans 12 today, and that is the New Testament, kind of more toward the back. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So we'll be in Romans 12. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, there's one underneath the seat somewhere around you, I believe. So um, before we do that, I, I just want you to know something. Um, and that is as we just prayed for, for Sophie and as we send out these seniors, um, Willie Kisto was saying God has a purpose for your life. And what I want you to hear from me is that God has a purpose for your life. That your life means something. That, that God intends to move in you and through you. So I think the end part is something that, that we're used to hearing. And in our, our culture, or Western culture, there's nothing wrong with Western culture, it's just it's where we live. Um, but we're, we're used to receiving things. We're, we're, we're used to things being about us, like it's individualistic. And so to, to, to hear and to think about that God would work in me, that through the grace of Christ, through the sacrifice of Jesus, through his life, death, victorious resurrection, and, and someday his return, that, that God is working in me and through me to change me, that makes sense to me. But, but, but there's not just a, a termination of that. It's, it's what is God doing in me and also through me? What is God doing in you and also through you? And you can't skip the, the in part to get to the through part. And so I'm not trying, please just let me just give a, ca a caveat today. I'm not trying to tell you how to be a good Christian today. Paul is not going to tell you how to be a good little boy or a good little girl, and you better go do these things. There's an in part, God moving in you, which leads to transformation, which leads to him working through you. So I just want you to hear that, that, that God has a mission for you. And, and we cook up all kinds of little baby missions for our lives. And they're cheap. And it can look something like, I, I want to go to this school, or, or I want to get this promotion, or I want to get my kids here, or I want to do... They're, they're just these little, little mini goals that we have. And they all last, and they're cheap, and God calls you into something not cheap, not short-term, not safe, but dangerous and meaningful and eternal. He calls us into something. If you are here and you're a Christian and you're bored, you should not be. And I don't want you to walk out of here bored. I want you to hear from the Word of God as God works in you that he would begin to work through you as well. So our text is Romans 12. Romans 1 through 11 is a master class in theology. This is the Apostle Paul in, in chapters 1 through 11 is like just the magnum opus of Christ-like theology. What did Jesus do? What is God's redemptive plan? How do the Gentiles get in? How do the Jews get in? How does this stuff all work? It's just this labyrinth, this tapestry of good theology. And he moves from that in chapter 12 to, okay, so what? What now? That's why you'll see, and I'll read it in just a second, he'll, he'll start our text with, therefore. Therefore what? Therefore, because this is who God is. This is his plan for humanity. This is who you are in him. Therefore, he'll tell us. And so chapters 1 through 11 are what you could call doctrine. What is doctrine? Well, a rough definition of, of that would be it's, it's the truth of God arranged into categories that we can understand. God can't be put in a box, but we can understand things if they're sorted better. And so doctrine is, is the collection of truth about God from his word. That's what doctrine is. And doctrine is not meant to, to stay in your head. It is meant to fuel your life. It is meant to fuel devotion. And, and so if you just have doctrine, you just have information. 
You can also just have devotion and have zeal, but not according to good doctrine. That's a problem too. But we're meant to, if you're a Christian, to by the word of God, have good doctrine and have that doctrine lead to devotional living. And that's why, by the way, we're doing the, the Theology on Fire class this Tuesday. It's to say, what, are the, what is true about God and therefore, how does that change the way we live? And so doctrine should fuel your life, because Christianity is not merely about thinking, although we need to think rightly. It's about living. It's about life, and so doctrine should fuel life. So, okay, that being said, Romans 12 says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, that means brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So this is the word of God. And in this text, I want us to look at, at, at three things. I want to look at what is the purpose for our lives. What, is, what does God say in his word is the purpose of our life? I want to look at the posture of our heart. What is our, what is our disposition toward this purpose that God has for us? How should we feel about what God says for us to do here? And then finally, the part that we're meant to play. What, what do we, okay, what do we actually do then? And so the purpose of your life, your purpose is right there in verse 1. It says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. When you see something like that in the Bible, don't, don't move past it. Those are big words. That's a, that's a high bar. That's a big statement, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice sacrifice. So a living sacrifice. That is a continual sacrifice. A daily sacrifice. A moment by moment sacrifice. To be a, a dead sacrifice, like, like in the old sacrificial system, a ram dies for something. It's, that's a transactional sacrifice. What Paul is saying here inspired by the Holy Spirit is be a living sacrifice. Be continually available to God. And what's a sacrifice? A sacrifice is a payment for a blessing. A sacrifice is, 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 is I will, will bleed for what? For something. To be a living sacrifice is a high bar. It's to bring yourself before God and say, here I am, Lord. I love in the Bible when he calls people. And they show up and they're like, here, here I am. There's like this openness to like, I don't know what you have for me, but let's go. You could say that, that this, this presenting yourself as a living sacrifice is throwing yourself at God. It's throwing yourself at him. Like, yes, God. You're sovereign, I'm not. I don't know what this even means. Yes, let's go. And so is this irrational? Is this Ill illogical? 
to be to be that open to God? Is this just is Paul just stirring up our emotions? Am I just trying to fire you up or something? Well, no, it, no. It says in 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 verse one that this is our spiritual worship that can be translated into rational service. What it means is this is logical. This, is, this response to present yourself as a living sacrifice is not crazy. It, it, it makes total sense, and it is the only logical conclusion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can that be? How can it be that instead of reckless abandon, you've heard that term, like, oh, they pursued that with reckless abandon, like they didn't even care, they just went. It's not reckless abandon that God is calling us to, but it is rational abandon. We're to be thinking people. And so if you think about the doctrine of the Bible, what the gospel is, Christians, listen, this is what you adhere to. This this is what you believe if you believe it. That before the foundation of the world, before dirt was dirt, before time was time, before oceans were oceans, before anything was anything, God had your name in mind. And he had a pre-commitment to you before anything was anything. And then when we ruined everything by rebelling against God, destroying the relationship that we have with him. In Psalm 102, it says he looked down from heaven and he heard the groans of the prisoners. That's us put in our own prison by our sin. And God says, I'm going to do something about that. And so committed to us, God comes from the perfect heavenly community. He is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfectly content within himself. God comes down and puts on flesh. And the king becomes homeless. And the holy one becomes subjected to torture and and ultimately execution. And he rose and Jesus remains committed to you today. Do you really believe this? Because there are implications if you do. If you really believe this, that this is the character of God, that this is the history of your salvation, that you are a recipient of this, that you are a part of this timeline, it is illogical to be lukewarm. It is illogical to sit on your hands. It is illogical to be bored. It is illogical to live a safe, scared life. It is illogical. But it is rational service. It makes sense to respond to this. Have you all seen Forrest Gump? It's been a while for me. But there's, there's this character. So Forrest Gump is this awesome, just almost pure man. He's not quite pure. No one's pure but Jesus, but he's almost pure. And he goes to Vietnam and he fights with this guy named Lieutenant Dan. They're in a firefight. Lieutenant Dan gets his legs blown off and he goes down this crazy downward spiral. But but Forrest loves Lieutenant Dan, like love loves. And so Forrest had always told Lieutenant Dan, I'm going to have a shrimp boat someday. That's what I'm going to do. And so we see later in the movie, Forrest he, he, he did it. He, he's, he made it out, and he's on his shrimp boat, and he's gliding by this, this, this dock, and Lieutenant Dan is on the dock in his wheelchair, and, and Forrest, just, he's fully clothed. He just jumps out of his shrimp boat, like still running as he hits the water, and he swims over to Lieutenant Dan. He's like, Lieutenant Dan! He's like, right here. Just this exuberant love of this man. That's the response a response of, I have been so loved, therefore, I so want in on what you have for me. I want nearness to you. I want your mission. I want to hear from you. And so this reminds me of John 21, which may be where they got this, this scene from. So Jesus 
is on the shore. It's kind of like Lieutenant Dan. So it says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They said, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and, and you'll find some. So they cast it and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. Like Forrest jumping after Lieutenant Dan. He's just like, dude, Jesus, he's here. They knew what Jesus had done. They knew who Jesus was. And so they were after him. Whatever he was doing there on the shore, they wanted to be about that. Rational abandon. Your purpose, my purpose, is to present your body as a living sacrifice in response to who Jesus is. And so it, the, the thing that, that always scares me in preaching a text like this that is so applicational is we need a caveat. That's why I started that way of just like, don't go do before you, you see what God has done. Don't hear five steps to be a better Christian. Be overcome by who Jesus is. And so by the posture of your heart matters a whole lot. And so Paul, he caveats his appeal to them, to these Romans, with grace. He says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. And then in verse 3, he says, by the grace given to me. And so what he's saying is, I appeal to you based on mercy, not merit. Paul was a maniac before he met Jesus. Paul had people like the people he's writing to, people like us, arrested, put in prison, executed before he met Jesus. Jesus meets Paul. Paul receives forgiveness and is sent on mission. So he says, I appeal to you, not based on my accomplishments, but based on Jesus' mercy. Let that be the caveat for what I'm appealing to you for. Let that be your caveat as you listen to what God's word says by mercy you don't present your body as a living sacrifice to receive mercy. You present your body as a living sacrifice because you are so overcome at the mercy of God, at the grace of God. And if that is your motivation, if grace is your motivation because grace demands a response, it's a powerful motivation. Being motivated by the favor of God, which you already have because of what he has done for you, is powerful. You will go further. You will last longer in the mission of God. If grace is compelling you, you have a sustainable, powerful source of motivation. I'm doing this because God loves me, and I want you to know about this. I'm doing this because God has blessed me, therefore I want to bless you, as opposed to the idiocracy that is religion of like, I'm doing this to show you how good I am. I'm doing this to show God that I'm worthy. No one lasts in that second system. No one makes it in trying to prove yourself over and over again, because at some point you don't. But grace as fuel... That's an eternally renewable energy source. Grace should fuel our lives as a living sacrifice. Mercy should fuel our lives as a living sacrifice. Paul has this little aside that seems kind of weird, but it actually, if you look at it, it makes sense. He, he gives a warning. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And before he, he gives some detail on what that might look like, he says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What, what does it mean to be conformed to the world? Well, well, that prefix con, it means with, formed. Don't be formed with the world. Don't be assimilated into the world. 
Don't get comfortable here. Don't get used to it here. Don't buy into the narratives of the world. The story of the world will tell you, which is that this is all you've got. That you determine your fate. You're, you're the master of your destiny. There's a lot of pressure on everyone in this room to be conformed to the world. To see by the lens of our temporary life. To see by the lens of, of secular hedonism. What does that mean? It just means worldly pursuit of joy. Of like, I have to wring out every drop of happiness for me. I don't care what it costs you because this short life is all I have. Don't be conformed to the world, he says but be transformed by the gospel. Be transformed by the eternal. Don't look at the temporary, look at the eternal. Don't look at the seen, look at the unseen. Don't be conformed because worldliness is an obstacle to living as a living sacrifice. And so then Paul goes on to say, you should see yourself with sober judgment. When you look in the mirror, you should not be excited at all times about what you see. You should not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. What does this look like? It means in every argument, you're right. It means your attentions were always good, no matter what, and people just misunderstood you. It means you've got it figured out politically. It means you've got it figured out economically. It means you've got it figured out, and so when you see the mirror, you think you see the person who's got it figured out. No, don't think of yourself that way. Think of yourself with sober judgment. Don't think you're awesome. The cross says some pretty sobering things about you. A proud Christian, that that makes no sense, none whatsoever. The cross says that you are so morally bankrupt, so spiritually bankrupt, that God had to die for you. And that you're so loved that he did, that he did know before the foundation of the world. But that should sober you. And so in this mission of God, what God calls us to do, if there's ever a moment where we are beating our chest, if there's ever a moment where we're thinking, look at me, we're not thinking with sober judgment. So have sober judgment. And if you're seeing clearly, this will not be a problem. See yourself clearly and you will have sober judgment. And if you don't have sober judgment, ask someone who loves you. They will give you your sober judgment. So what's the part we're meant to play? What does it say? What what should we do? It says in verse 4, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of of one another. What that means is the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ and he's the head. And what Paul just said here is that 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 if you're a Christ follower, you belong to Jesus and we belong to one another. So we belong to Jesus and we belong to one another. We are vitally connected to the body of Christ, the church just as body parts are vitally connected to other body parts. So somebody may have beautiful eyes, just piercing eyes. But if one of those eyes was sitting here on the stage, it would be horrendous. It would be grotesque. Why is it that that in movies or traffic accidents or I don't know what you've seen, but a a body part not connected to a body, it it, it makes your stomach turn. It's nasty. It's, 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 It's gross. It's because it's not connected to the source of life to which it belongs. And in the same way, using Paul's metaphor, 
really using Jesus' metaphor, is we are not to be disembodied Christians. I am not my own. I belong to Jesus and to you. It will be vitally connected. And as different body parts, different body parts have different functions. And so I am not a math guy. I'm not. But Keith Johnson is one of our elders who, who's handled our finances for years. He is, and I praise God for him. I am not a singer, but Audrey and Kisto, praise God, they are. We have different functions, and they're all necessary. They're all critical. So Paul is going to give us some, some, some practical categories for this. How to present your body as a living sacrifice. What to say yes to. It says in prophecy. So that's, that's, that's explaining, that's telling the revealed truth of God. Being a truth teller. In service, that means to deacon. That's a verb. It means to, to serve. It literally means to like wait tables. There's teaching, imparting knowledge to people to help them grow in wisdom. There's exhortation. That's someone pleading with someone or encouraging someone in the truth. That's what's happening right now. Or contribution. It means financial generosity. There's leadership. There's people that are gifted to, to, to coach people up, to make people better, and to help them accomplish a mission. Some people are gifted in leadership. And then there's this last category, which I really Love. It says to the, to the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. There's some people that just have empathetic hearts. And they will sit with the suffering and they will weep with the weeping and they will rejoice with the rejoicing and they will sit with you. And that is a gift. And so I've not, this, this, this list, Paul has not just talked past Anyone in this room, none of you should look at this list and go, I'm, I'm not included in here. You're included in here somewhere. I know some people are like, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a leader. Well, you're probably not if you're saying that. But the chairs you're sitting in were put together by somebody in our church family. The building in which we sit was funded by generous church family members. Right now in, in TDC Kids, they're, they're imparting knowledge and wisdom and gospel realities to the next generation that someday we would send them out, as Kisto said, as arrows into the world. You all have a part to play. And I love that he says in verse 6, use them. Don't sit on your hands with what God has given you. Get busy using them. And what I would say is don't overthink it. If someone asks you what time it is, don't build them a watch. Tell them what time it is. If you don't know what this looks like for you, ask how you can help. Don't overthink it. And don't overlook yourself. You are needed. The church body needs you to be you and to exercise those gifts. We all need to play our part. And so as we think about this, as we think about being a, a living sacrifice, I just want to ask you, has your doctrine detonated? Has the collection of beliefs in your mind trickled down from your head into your heart? Or is it still information? You see, I think that the disconnect is, is so often that we don't understand the sacrifice of Jesus. I think that we can see the gospel as a history lesson versus a present reality that has weight on you and on me. You see, he is the living sacrifice. Anything we do is in response to his sacrifice. He is the living sacrifice. And so as you consider what, what is your response to that, what do you do with this reality? 
Are you amazed by grace? Are you being transformed by the renewal of your mind and the warming of your heart as these realities sink down from your head into your heart and they detonate and they lead to different living? What is your posture towards serving if you serve in this church family or another one? What is your posture towards supporting your spouse or your family member if they serve in a local church body? What is your posture? Are you encouraging, equipping, and celebrating, or is it begrudging? A lot of us, we we hold out because we don't really believe. We believe, but we don't believe. And that doctrine just stays cold in our hearts, but as we consider Jesus, we're being transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we all being transformed. As we behold the glory of the Lord, we're being changed as we see Jesus. This is why we're talking about Jesus. He's worthy of being talked about, but he's the only way to transformation. To sit in this gospel reality and to be comforted by it and so motivated by it that we would live differently. Jesus is the living sacrifice. Hebrews 7 says this. It says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus intercedes for you now. He is not a historical event. But he intercedes for you. Do you know that? Do you know that in the Bible it says that he prays for you? That at all costs, he purchased you? Does that do anything to you? It should make you feel safe enough to risk yourself as a living sacrifice. You see, if you look at what Paul says about these these different gifts, let's look at how Jesus used them. Prophecy. Jesus declared the Father's will perfectly and at all times. Service. He washed the disciples' feet, which is and was nasty. He he taught about the kingdom of God. He explained the reality of the truth of who he was and what was coming. He exhorted with sinners to repent. He said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He was generous. He gave himself for you. And he leads. He says, follow me. Drop what you're doing. Come on, let's go. In mercy, acts of mercy, Jesus cheerfully moves towards sinners like us with a heart of empathy. Saying, I'll pay the cost for your blessing. What's the blessing? It's knowing him. It's not a safe, comfortable life. It's not ease. But it's knowing him. And living in that reality, this is the happiest, most joyful thing ever. To know Jesus, to walk with Jesus. And he goes into sketch places because that's who he is. So what does his holy and acceptable sacrifice, which is exactly what he is? Holy, set apart, perfect, blameless acceptable. He's the only sacrifice that would do for the salvation of the world to pay for sinners. His holy and acceptable sacrifice makes you holy and acceptable to God. Can you believe this? A safe, comfy life is not a living sacrifice. Your doctrine has to detonate. And as you behold Jesus and that is stare at the many 
many infinite facets of who he is, you begin to change. So let's pray that God would make this reality of Jesus, our living sacrifice, more real to us. Would you pray with me? Lord, I ask for a a deeper understanding that, that Jesus is, Jesus, you are our living sacrifice. That this body purchased by your blood, reconciled by your sacrifice, that, that the end goal, the, the prize that we get is you. And so where we are living as a conditional sacrifice, where we are living as a transactional sacrifice, where we are living as a fearful sacrifice, would you overcome us, Holy Spirit, with the, the heavenly doctrine trickle down and flood our hearts that we would have zeal to live as a living sacrifice in whatever category you may have for us. May we, may we come to you and just say, here I am, Lord. I'm okay in Christ. I've been purchased in Christ. And so use me, whatever that means. And help us to not grow weary in doing good, but to be a living, continual, joyful sacrifice. I pray now as we sing that, Holy Spirit, would you well up a, a great sense of joy in us, of gratitude, that we would be motivated by grace to live as a city on a hill, to display your mercies to the world around us. Transform us, God, transform us. In Jesus' name.